Watch us on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast and support us on Patreon. Thanks for stopping by. Clinical holistic medicine has its roots in the medicine and tradition of Hippocrates. Modern epidemiological research in quality of life, the emerging science of complementary and alternative medicine, the tradition of psychodynamic therapy, and the tradition of bodywork are merging into a new scientific way of treating patients. Millennia ago, around 300 BCE, at the island of Kos in Old Greece, the students of the famous physician Hippocrates worked to help their patients to step into character, get direction in life, and use their human talents for the benefit of their surrounding world. For all that we know this approach was extremely efficient medicine that helped the patients to recover health, quality of life, and ability, and Hippocrates gained great fame. For more than 2000 years this was what medicine was about in most of Europe. On other continents similar medical systems were developed. The medicine will of the Native Americans, the African Sangoma culture, the Samic shamans of Northern Europe, the healers of the Australian Aboriginals, the Ayurvedic doctors of India, the acupuncturists of China, and the herbal doctors of Tibet all seems to be fundamentally character medicine. All the theories and the medical understanding from these pre-modern cultures are now being integrated in what is called integrative or transcultural medicine. Many of the old medical systems are reappearing in modern time as alternative, complementary, and psychosocial medicine. What is happening today? Interestingly, two huge movements of the last century have put this old knowledge into use, psychoanalysis and psychodynamic therapy, most importantly SCDP, going though the mind on one hand, and bodywork, and most importantly, and sexual therapy, especially the tantric tradition. Almost 20 years ago, we were conducting epidemiological research on quality of life closely, examining the connection between global quality of life and health in a series of huge surveys using large and extensive questionnaires, some of them with over 3,000 questions. We found a quite surprisingly, from this huge database that quality of life, mental and physical health, and ability of social, sexual, and working ability seem to be caused primarily by the consciousness and philosophy of life of the person in question, and only to a small extent by objective factors, like being adopted, coming from a family with only one breadwinner, mother being mentally ill, or oneself being financially poor or poorly educated, which are obviously very much socially inherited. This scientific finding was not expected and so counterintuitive for us that we were forced to investigate the subject going to the roots of Western medicine or the Hippocratic character of medicine. This meant that we had to look at transcultural and integrative medicine, the emerging science of alternative medicine and to the very much forgotten traditions of psychosomatic, psychodynamic, and bodily oriented therapies. Theoretically, epidemiologically, statistically, we have been looking at what seems to be the common denominator for all existential healing work in all cultures at all times. We have also been debating many difficult issues related to modern day medical science. What we have learned from this long journey through the grand medical heritage from the different cultures on this planet is that we need to work on body mind and spirit at the same time medicine men has always combined talking, touching, and praying, and that being human and truly kind is what really heals the other person. This is what Hippocrates called the art of one, not the art of medicine, or the art of right living, but simply the art of the way of the human heart cultivating existence into sheer compassionate behavior and joyful being, which has always been the ultimate goal of all the great healers in our history. The most paradoxal aspect of this is that while we like to think we are taking medicine forward, 
we are actually just taking medicine back to its roots. The most important thing is that research and development in this field is made in a dialectic process between qualitative and quantitative research. There are basically two ways of documenting an effect of a holistic medical intervention, the quantitative and the qualitative approach. Much effort has been given to developing valid methodology and measuring tools, but the art of documentation has become a complex and expensive task. In this communication we will focus on the qualitative research method. Fortunately the holistic approach makes it much simpler, because there are always three domains to investigate, health, quality of life and ability. These three domains can be subdivided in as many detailed domains as one wishes, but often three are sufficient for most purposes. There are two qualitative aspects of documenting effect in medicine, often called subjective, that is from the perspective and experience of the patient, and objective, that is from the perspective of the therapist or researcher. To document effect of an intervention using both perspectives, the patient must be interviewed before and after the intervention. Semi-structured interviews with interview rating of the state immediately before and after the intervention can be used to give the objective perspective on the effect of the intervention. Interviewing the patient after the intervention can give the patient's subjective experience of the effect. Most importantly these perspectives often leads to two different results, but confronting the patient with the observed improvement, after the patient has given his own experience of the effect, can be very enlightening. The consensus paradigm states that only to the degree that there is consensus between patient and therapist observer, the treatment has an effect. If the patient experience an effect that cannot be observed, something else is likely to have happened. A pleasant experience with the therapy is not the same as the effect of a treatment. If the patient does not experience an observed effect, this effect is most likely to be happening only in the observer's mind. Very often a therapist is convinced that a cure or intervention gave a positive result, but the fact that the patient did not experience that is then often neglected. So if the patient did not experience any improvement, such an improvement is most likely not to have happened. Interestingly one single patient is enough to document effect with the consensus paradigm. If both the physician and his patient, after careful investigation before and after the treatment, find that the treatment has helped, this is most likely the case. The more precise the target group and the treatment are defined, the more valuable the documentation. We recommend for securing the validity that the presented method is used with five highly comparable patients receiving five highly comparable treatments. As always we recommend for the observer rating a five-point symmetrical Likert scale with neutral middle point and equidistance 143. A clinically significant improvement must be half a step on this scale or more. The patient needs to express the gain as a significant improvement. There are lots of possible advantages with the scientific holistic medicine that must be closely examined in future research. How can it be maker affordable, efficient medicine for the future the possibility to prevent disease? The possibility to cure cancer and coronary heart disease. The possibility to seroconvert HIV positive patients to HIV negative. The possibility to relieve pain and discomfort. The possibility of rehabilitating working ability. The possibility of improving people's competency as parents. The possibility of improving working efficiency though development of talent. The possibility of helping people to be happy in spite of difficult circumstances and challenges. Holistic education encompasses a wide range of philosophical orientations and pedagogical practices. Its focus is on wholeness, 
and it attempts to avoid excluding any significant aspects of the human experience. It is an eclectic and inclusive movement whose main characteristic is the idea that educational experiences foster a less materialistic and a more spiritual worldview along with more dynamic and holistic views of reality it also proposes that educational experience promote a more balanced development of and cultivate the relationship among the different aspects of the individual, intellectual, physical, spiritual, emotional, social and aesthetic, as well as the relationships between the individual and other people, the individual and natural environment, the inner self of students and external world, emotion and reason, different discipline of knowledge and different form of knowing. Holistic education is concerned with life experience, not with narrowly defined basic skills. In holistic education is a fairly new movement, which began to take form as a recognizable field of study and practice in North America. It emerged as a response to the dominant worldview of mainstream education, often referred to the mechanistic worldview. Rather than attempting to provide a model of education, holistic education seeks to challenge the fragmented, reductionistic assumptions of mainstream culture and education. In other words, holistic education is concerned with underlying worldviews or paradigms in an attempt to transform the foundations of education. Holistic education is not to be defined as a particular method or technique. It must be seen as a paradigm, a set of basic assumptions and principles that can be applied in diverse ways. Holistic education addresses the broadest development of the whole person. It aims for the fullest possible human development enabling a person to become the very best or finest that they can be and develop fully those capacities that together make up a human being. A main element of holistic education is its focus on the interconnectedness of experience and reality. Holistic education attempts to develop a pedagogy that is interconnected and dynamic, and thus is in harmony with the cosmos in contrast, much of traditional education tends to be static and fragmented, ultimately promoting alienation and suffering in nevers. Holistic education focuses on the relationship between the whole and the part and suggests that teaching and learning approaches need to be rooted in a larger vision. Within this holistic perspective, the student is positioned as an active, participatory. The holistic vision includes a sense of the whole person and environment. Holistic education frequently claims that it wants to educate the whole child or all parts of the child, educate the student as a whole and not an assemblage of parts, see the child as part of a whole society, humanity, the environment some spiritual whole, from which it is not meaningful to extract the student. Holistic education challenges the present approach to education and its obsessive focus on standards and testing. Holistic educators see this approach as reflecting a materialist and consumerist culture that has reduced schooling to the training of individuals to compete and consume in the global marketplace. The present thrust can be seen as abandoning any attempt to educate the whole human being. It reduces schooling to training for the workplace that can be easily assessed through standardized tests. Holistic educators are convinced that the further evolution of civilization and human consciousness requires a renewed measure of respect and reverence for the inner life of the growing person. Holistic education provides students with a sense of meaning and order to things. By introducing students to a holistic view of the planet, life on Earth, holistic strategies enable students to perceive and understand the various contexts which shape and give meaning to life. Holistic education is a journey for both the educator and the student. For both, the nature of holistic education can change as they each progress through the program and draw different experiences from it.
The process of holistic education must therefore be flexible and dynamic to accommodate these personal differences and influences. Differences in the rate of personal progression, a holistic ideal can be traced back to indigenous cultures. In general, the aboriginal or indigenous person sees the earth and the universe as infused with meaning and holistic educators try to recover this sense of meaning and purpose in education. The concept of holism comes from the Greek concept of holon, that sees the universe as made up of integrated wholes that cannot be reduced in parts. The Greeks argued for a holistic approach in learning. Socrates can be seen as a holistic educator because he encouraged each person to examine his or her own life, know thyself. The holistic paradigm emerged as a vibrant and coherent intellectual movement in the 1980s and has been expressed by thinkers. It has deep roots in ancient spiritual traditions and cosmologies which Aldous Huxley described as the perennial philosophy. When the so-called enlightenment of the 18th century elevated analytical, scientific reason to dominance in the West, this perennial wisdom, at the recognition of humanity's intimate connection to the evolving cosmos, was relegated to a dissident movement labeled Romanticism. Holistic education thus has its roots in the Romantic, educational theories of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Pestalozzi, and Froebel. Rousseau, Pestalozzi, and Froebel along with other holistic educators of 19th and 20th centuries such as transcendentalists William Ellery, Chaining, Rolf Waldo Emerson, Henry David, Thoreau, Bronson Alcott, and Francis Parker as well as Montessori, and Rudolf Steiner all emphasized the spiritual nature of the human being. Rousseau, although more humanistic than holistic in his approach to education, did provide some underpinnings for holistic education. Rousseau viewed the child as essentially good and believed that the soul of the child should be allowed to unfold according to its own natural pattern. This view of the child as good is a basic assumption of holistic education which rejects the fundamentalist view that children are born in original sin. Pestalozzi, a Swiss educator influenced by Rousseau, put his ideas into practice. He believed that the classroom should be a place for meaningful activity, and he encouraged teachers to use their intuition. In the past century two of the most important holistic educators have been Rudolf Steiner and Maria Montessori, Steiner was the founder of the Waldorf School movement, which began shortly after World War I, and has grown since its inception. Steiner distinctly referred to the soul life of children and how it could be nurtured in a school setting. Maria Montessori, the founder of the Montessori School movement, also believed in the importance of nurturing the spiritual development of children. She believed that mental, physical, and spiritual qualities of the human being are supported by a divine life source. With regard to the spiritual aspect, it was her belief that within each person there is a spiritual embryo that is developing according to a divine plan. And the most urgent duty of a teacher to a child was to eliminate as many obstacles to this development as possible. Montessori believed that if children were provided with a nurturing environment, Form would direct the natural unfolding of the child personality and powers so that he or she would become an independent adult. Montessori firmly believed that making children learn things was not as important as keeping intelligence alive. The key, then, is to develop a learning environment in which the child's intelligence can naturally unfold. Perennial philosophy has guided the works of John Miller. Parker Palmer, amongst other contemporary holistic educators, the perennial philosophy usually acknowledges multiple dimensions of reality. In his classic The Perennial Philosophy, Huxley gives a definition. The perennial philosophy is primarily concerned with the one, divine reality substantial to the manifold world of things and lives and minds. The main been incorporated themes of perennial philosophy 
that have by holistic education are divine reality, oneness, wholeness, and multiple dimensions of reality. Indigenous or Aboriginal or native worldviews from all over the world are filled with reverence for nature, the earth, the universe, and the spirit. They emphasize the organic interconnectedness of all beings. The indigenous worldviews are multidimensional in character. According to Black Elk's account, Wakantanka stands for the infinite as well as the finite dimensions. It is everything, and yet above everything, the source and end of everything, and the one who watches over and sustains all life. The major ideas included the indigenous worldview that have been built into the theories and practices of holistic education are reverence for nature, the earth, the universe, and the spirit, the interconnectedness and sacredness of reality, and human's reintegration with nature. The concept of a life has a central importance for many holistic educators. Ron Miller introduced the term a life-centered to describe the spiritually rooted holistic education. The philosophy of life or life philosophy assumes that there exists a fundamental life force or a universal life process. The life in this sense is both a transcendental and imminent principle of the cosmic world. This orientation of holistic education conceives education as an integral part of the greater life process. That is, education is a manifestation of life, and at the same time a vehicle in the service of reconnecting human life with the fundamental life. This life force generates and organizes all beings in the cosmos. Our lives have a purpose, a direction, a meaning, and a goal that transcends our personal egos and particular physical and cultural conditioning. It recognizes that we are connected, at deep and profound levels, to the continuing evolution of life and the universe. The ecological perspective is so integral in contemporary holistic education that the term holistic is often interchangeably used with ecological. A large part of holistic education can be seen as ecological holistic education. The holistic philosophy would seem to forward an ecologically sensitive view of the educational process. The ecological worldview is often addressed in holistic education through ecological literacy, where topics such as environmental issues, dialogues with nature, the interdependence of reality and sustainability are explored. Edward Clark, David Orr, and Ramon Nova have been some of the most active contemporary holistic educators in this area. Systems theory is a theoretical attempt to explore the cosmic world. Similarly to the ecological worldview, systems theory also recognizes the interdependence of all things but its exploration of the subject is based on systemic explanations of the dynamic structure of the universe, or the cosmic world. This systemic worldview is present in the holistic theory of Ron Miller, a theory based on multiple levels of wholeness. In the integrated curriculum of Edward Clark, a systemic curriculum built on system thinking, and in the work of few other scholars, most notably Thomas Berry and Atsuhiko Yoshida, in the field of holistic education. Thomas Berry provided one of the most magnificent visions of education that has ever emerged. Education, in his view, is not a human enterprise, but rather an ongoing process of the universe itself. Yoshida appeared in the discussion of Japanese life philosophy, tried to develop his model of holistic education through his extensive studies in postmodern, non-mechanistic, non-reductionistic, systemic sciences, including Jancha's theory of the self-organizing universe. The most relevant work of Noddings to holistic education has been her ideas on caring relations. Noddings has proposed a caring-centered education that calls for the cultivation of relations of care in school, which includes caring for the self, for the inner circle, for distant others, for animals, plants, and the earth, for the human-made world, 
and for the world of ideas, similar to noddings, but focusing more on the egalitarian aspects of relationships. Isla designed a model of education, which she called a partnership education. Nodding's thoughts on a caring relations, and Isla's ideas on partnership education, are directly or indirectly present in the works of virtually every holistic educator. For methodological purpose only, holistic education has noted four pillars of learning in the 21st century. This starts with learning to ask, to ask is a natural act of consciousness in its search for knowledge. Its real purpose is not so much for the question to be answered, as to be explored. Learning to learn means empowering the attributes of consciousness to exercise skills such as paying attention, listening, perceiving, and developing curiosity, intuitiveness, and creativity. Learning to learn means having the ability to direct, and take responsibility for one's own learning, for keeping oneself up to date, for knowing where to look for knowledge. This type of learning is radically different from acquiring itemized codified information or factual knowledge, as often stressed in conventional curriculum and in rote learning. Rather it implies the asking of the instruments of knowledge themselves. Learning to do is linked learning a profession and to productive work learning to adapt to the needs of work, and ability to work in a team, along with the strategic use of knowledge to resolve problems, and make rational decisions in generating quality goods and services. Learning to do means knowing how to take risks, as well as take the initiative. This pillar of learning implies in the first place for application of what learners have learned or known into practices, it is closely linked to vocational technical education and work skills training. However, it goes beyond narrowly defined skills development for doing the specific things or practical tasks in traditional or industrial economies. The emerging knowledge-based economy is making human work increasingly immaterial. Learning to do calls for new types of skills, more behavioral than intellectual. The material and the technology are becoming secondary to human qualities and interpersonal relationship. This pillar implies an education taking two complementary parts. On one level, discovery of others, and on another, experience of shared purposes throughout life. Specifically it implies the development of such qualities as knowledge and understanding of self and others, appreciation of the diversity of the human race, and an awareness of the similarities between, and the interdependence of, all humans, empathy, respect of other, people and their cultures and value systems. Learning to be means the discovery of true human nature, and encounter with the essence of oneself, which goes beyond the psychic apparatus of thoughts and emotion. It is learning to belong to the whole, it is the discovery of our universal dimension. It is the discovery of one's own being, and the inner wisdom achieved through self-knowledge. Holistic education nurtures this learning in a special way, by recognizing the human being as a basically spiritual being in search of meaning. Learning to be may therefore be interpreted in one way as learning to be human through acquisition of knowledge, skills and values conducive to personality development in its intellectual, moral, cultural, and physical dimensions. This implies a curriculum aiming at cultivating qualities of imagination and creativity, developing a person's potential, memory, reasoning, aesthetic sense, physical capacity, and communication social skills, developing critical thinking, and exercising independent judgment. Wholeness holds that everything in the universe is interconnected to everything else. Everything that exists is related in a context of interconnectedness, and meaning, and any change or event affects everything else. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. This means that the whole is comprised of relational patterns that are not contained in the parts. 
therefore, a phenomenon can never be understood in isolation. The person is viewed as an integral being with six essential elements, physical, emotional, intellectual, social, aesthetic, and spiritual. These six elements play a fundamental role in the learning process. Even though, traditionally, the cognitive aspect has been favored, holistic education recognizes the importance of balance among the six elements. Holistic educators do not see the student as a brain that must be programmed, but rather as a whole being. In the course of human interaction, a community can be comprised of the school, the town, or even the family. When holistic education work with the school as a context, they transform it into a stimulating learning community, and meaning is acquired through the relationship with others. Learning how to establish appropriate human relationships is an objective of education, and to the goals we impose upon ourselves as a society. It is a crucial dimension of holistic education, given society's current situation, replete with the prevailing value of exploitation, control, success, and competition. The ideal of unlimited economic growth has resulted in people pinning their hopes for happiness on the consumption of products and superfluous gratifications. Holistic education recognize this social crisis the planet is the fourth context of our lives and of the learning process. Traditionally, the planet has not been taken into account because it has not been perceived as a context for holistic educators. The planet is Gaia, a complex and harmonious organism of dynamic processes and integrated whole that is alive and self-regulating, of which human societies as well as economic political, and cultural systems, are dependent subsystems. The primary whole, the complete context that gives meaning to our being the spiritual dimension of human existence. In holistic education, taking recourse in the cosmos is the most significant response to the serious crisis humanity is now facing, and perennial human spiritual values the dualism and fragmentation are completely overcome, and the self and all else in existence come together and awaken consciousness to its true nature. It is within this context that universal love, unconditional trion, brotherhood, peace, and compassion bloom. The essential meaning of the cosmos can only be understood through direct experience. The goal of holistic education is best encapsulated by the term, ultimacy. He defined ultimacy as, one of the highest state of being that a human can aspire to, either as a stage of development, enlightenment, as a moment of life that is the greatest but only rarely experienced by anyone or as a phase of life that is common in the population but usually rare in any particular individual's life for example maslow's peak experience the concern or engagement that is the greatest that a person can aspire to for example being in service to something sacred these two meanings can overlap or intertwine Ultimacy, also called enlightenment or union with cosmic harmony, is a common theme throughout the holistic literature. It is the highest potential of the student who is involved in a holistic educational process. Forbes promotes the theme of ultimacy, and through his research, provides enlightenment as to the philosophical coherence of what distinguishes holistic education from mainstream approaches to education. The notions of ultimacy lead holistic educators to their views of human nature and meaningful living. Holistic educators claim their view of original goodness stands in opposition to that of original sin, and that different views concerning the need or lack of need to control and shape children necessarily follow. Holistic educators feel they have a different view of development which holds that people will naturally go towards the good, and that progress consists largely of unfolding, uncovering, 
or discovering what is natural or inherent in the child. The primary purpose of education is to nourish the inherent possibilities of human development schools must be places that facilitate the whole development of all learners. Each learner is unique, inherently creative, with individual needs and abilities. This means welcoming personal differences and fostering in each student a sense of tolerance, respect, and appreciation for human diversity. Each individual is inherently creative, has unique physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs and abilities, and possesses an unlimited capacity to learn. Education is a matter of experience, and learning is primarily experimental. Learning is an active, multisensory engagement between an individual and the world, a mutual contact which empowers the learner and reveals the rich meaningfulness of the world. Experience is dynamic and ever-growing. The goal of education must be to nurture natural, healthy growth through experience and not to present a limited, fragmented, pre-digested a curriculum as the path to knowledge and wisdom. The concept of a wholeness should be at the core of the educational process. Wholeness implies that each academic discipline provides merely a different perspective on the rich, complex, integrated phenomenon of life. Holistic education celebrates and makes constructive use of evolving, alternate views of reality and multiple ways of knowing. It is not only the intellectual and vocational aspects of human development that need guidance and nurturance, but also the physical, social, moral, aesthetic, creative, and in a non-sectarian sense, spiritual aspects. Many of today's educators have become caught in the trappings of competitive professionalism, tightly controlled credentials, and certification jargon and special techniques, and a professional aloofness from the spiritual, moral and emotional issues inevitably involved in the process of human growth. Educators ought to be facilitators of learning, which is an organic, natural process and not a product that can be turned out on demand. Teachers require the autonomy to design and implement learning environments that are appropriate to the needs of their particular students. Students and parents should have opportunities for real choice at every stage of the learning process. Genuine education can only take place in an atmosphere of freedom. Freedom of inquiry, of expression, and of personal growth are all required. In general, students should be allowed authentic choices in their learning. They should have a significant voice in determining curriculum and disciplinary procedures according to their ability to assume such responsibility. Education must spring organically from a profound reverence for life in all its forms and nurture a relationship between humans and the natural world. We must rekindle a relationship between the human and the natural world that is nurturing, not exploitive. This is at the very core of our vision for the 21st century. The planet Earth is a vastly complex, but fundamentally unitary living system, an oasis of life in the dark void of space. Holistic educator believe that all people are spiritual beings in human form who express their individuality through their talents, abilities, intuition, and intelligence. Just as the individual develops physically, emotionally, and intellectually, each person also develops spiritually. Spiritual experience and development manifest as a deep connection to self and others, a sense of meaning and purpose in daily life, an experience of the wholeness and interdependence of life, a respite from the frenetic activity, pressure and over stimulation of contemporary life, the fullness of creative experience, and a profound respect for the numinous mystery of life. 
John Miller frames holistic education within a transformation of education. The core motto of holistic education is to seek transformation, that is, to seek the continuing growth of the individual and society. John Miller synthesizes holistic education as an approach that encompasses three main principles. One, connection, entails integrating school subjects, establishing connections with the community, fostering students' relationship with the earth, and encouraging students to connect to their souls, their deeper sense of selves. Two, inclusion refers to including students of diverse races, and abilities, and providing a range of educational approaches to attend the differences in learning styles. And three, the balance means reaching for equilibrium between complementary energies, individual learning, and group learning, analytic thinking, and intuitive thinking, content and process, and learning and assessment. Holistic education is an approach to pedagogy that can meet the needs of all types of learners, that can be a source of fulfillment and gratification for teachers, and that repairs future citizens who will contribute a concern and mindfulness for others, for their communities, and for the planet. It is compatible with both global education and environmental education, which are also based on the principles of interdependence and connectedness. Based on this interdependent perspective, holistic education seeks to create a society where we live in harmony with the surrounding environment. It rejects consumerism as the dominant mode of being in modern society. Instead, it seeks an education that is rooted in the fundamental realities of nature and existence. Holistic education seeks to connect the part with the whole. We have tended in education to forget the larger vision of wholeness and connectedness, and holistic education calls on us to restore that vision. Such a vision, of course, is a primary goal of education for sustainability. Overall, we can describe holistic education as containing the following broad characteristics. One that nurtures the development of the whole person. Two that revolves around relationships. Three that is concerned with life experiences instead of with basic skills. Four it recognizes that cultures are created by people and can be changed by people instead of conforming and replicating or established culture. And five it is founded upon a deep reverence for life and for the unknown and never fully knowable the source of life. This was brought to you by The Strange, The Bizarre, The Unusual, I Like It, on YouTube and Facebook. Listen to our podcast on any of these platforms. Inker, Breaker, Overcast, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify. Support us on Patreon. And check us out on Discord. All the links can be found in the description below. We thank you for your participation. If you enjoyed please like, subscribe, share, make comments. We love feedback.